virtual CPD summer school. It's fantastic to have so many of you here this morning. Um, my name is Charlotte Stevenson. I'm a business development manager at Cardiff University. Um, just two pieces of quick housekeeping before we get going. Um, you may have missed it in the video there. We've got the chat function available this morning if you want to chat to the team. Um, any sound problems you want to let us know about, use that. Any questions you want to pose to um, Fiona, please use the Q&A section and we'll cover those at the end. Um, please bear with us if there's any technical problems or all working from home, um, any comedy talking while on mute or interruptions from children, animals, or in my case yesterday, a very persistent delivery driver. Um, I'd like to introduce our fantastic speaker this morning, morning um, Dr. Fiona Rawlinson, um, who is um, Programme Director of Palliative Care at Cardiff University and a consultant at City Hospice. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you, Charlotte. It's absolutely a delight to be part of the session and um, the first technical hitch has arrived. So bear with me, bear with me, people, because a cunning button that says share your screen. So I'm just going to share my screen and start again. Uh, we are rolling. So, in business. The whole purpose of adding to the summer school and making, making really, trying to make sense of what's been a, 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 a challenging year for everybody, for me is just that part of sharing skills and sharing knowledge and trying to equip us all for in a world which I think we're not quite sure really what's going to happen. Everything's different. If you're working in a way that you were working three months ago, then you, you, you've been somewhere different. Everything is different. So this session is around palliative and end of life care for all. And I've kind of divided it into 10 signposts to effective delivery. And whilst I was putting the talk together and thinking with Charlotte and the CPD unit, reflecting back on our years of developing short courses for palliative care. 
and most of those have been for healthcare professionals, but I'm aware that some people watching this and taking part in the summer school may not be healthcare professionals. So I've tried to make it applicable for everybody. I think what we've learned in 2020 is that palliative care is everybody's business. The world has effectively been closed for 2020. And whether you've been affected yourself, whether somebody in your team, whether somebody in your family, the whole thing about the pandemic is that it's brought palliative care into sharp focus. Everything stopped. And so for us developing palliative care and wanting to make the best of however long is life for however long life is left for many people, actually that's been really difficult for the palliative care world too, because some of the things that we usually do like encouraging families to be together at the end of life has not been possible because of the virus. So certainly in the early days while we were working out how we could wear PPE effectively well, and while we were working out how could we bring families together, those have been some very challenging times and the speed and the unexpectedness I think took many of us by surprise. So what am I hoping to do over the next kind of half an hour, 45 minutes. I'm hoping that I can signpost you, wherever you work, whatever you do, to some useful resources. I'd like to outline what's different in communities and health and social care at the moment. Again, whether you're a, a, a healthcare um, professional, a social care professional, or whether you're, it's just something completely unrelated to you and you're listening for interest, that's great. Palliative care is everybody's business. But there are some changes that you need to understand are happening at the moment. I'm going to talk a little bit about communication skills and communication strategies but that I know as part of the summer school there are other specific sessions on communication skills so I'm not going to take away from any of those. These are just kind of teasers, tasters if you like. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end about bereavement and grieving just because so many of us have been affected, whether it's friends, whether it's colleagues, whether it's family, whether it's knowing friends who are in a situation of grieving, whether it's as a result of the coronavirus or not. But I'm going to talk a little bit about grieving. But the basic thing is I want to, I want to make you feel empowered. This virus this year has left many of us feeling way out of control and being controlled by some invisible force. And that's not a comfortable place to be. But there are some things that you can be in control of. So the aim of this session is to empower you with some knowledge and suggestions, really turning it from what I can't do to what can I do. So what is palliative care? The pictures of Dame Cicely Saunders. It's about maxing, maximising quality of life in incurable illness, however long that is. And Dame Cicely's famous phrase, you, you matter because you're you difficult in healthcare systems to really deliver individualised care and any of us who've been on the receiving end of healthcare delivery knows how important that is. Well, When illness strikes it kind of can take away your very identity which is very disempowering, it's very disabling whether physically or whether it's mentally. So what the palliative care skills are trying to do is to put it back, put the quality of life back make people feel the person that they want to be, whatever the physical condition underlying them. Where does palliative care fit in modern health and social care delivery? Very good question. Is it a separate specialty? Well, I would argue no. It underpins absolutely everything that we all do. And actually palliative care fits in all of our worlds. We are members of family. There are people in our family who may need us to have some of those skills, even if we are not healthcare professionals or social care professionals. So it's everybody's business in our work, in our families, in our communities. And gosh, the coronavirus pandemic has definitely shown us that with some wonderful community actions and community caring. Relative care is everybody's business. We've all got a response. What can we do to help? What can you do to help? what can I do to help? I think the first thing to do is to be ready. Palliative care issues don't happen to just to other people. At some point in your life, if they haven't already, you will be affected by them. 
It can happen to anybody, anytime, with or without warning. This year has shown us that. So have you had conversations? Do you know what's important to your family? Do you know what's important to your partner? Have you told other people what's important to you? If you were affected suddenly by a life limiting and in the coronavirus and pandemic a particularly swiftly life limiting illness, what, what do you need people to know? How to care kind of teaches you how to live, I think. So signpost one, be ready. Know where to go for key resources. This slide is particularly for coronavirus because particularly in those early days in the United Kingdom in March and early April, there was such a lot of information coming out there and information that wasn't necessarily based on fact. So this slide is particularly for coronavirus, but in, interrogate, interrogate the sources that you can trust. So the WHO, Public Health England, Public Health Wales, your local health board, wherever you're working or trust if it's in the UK. Um, Twitter and social media is useful for headlining, but actually the anxiety sometimes around the Twitter discussions, which aren't necessarily based on fact, people are wondering, people are uncertain, that adding to uncertainty can actually be quite anxious making. So I would say be strategic. It's great, it's really useful, but be strategic. What's been the impact of COVID on working and communities? The biggest one, and it's still an issue, is that the networks have changed. So we're finding new ways to do things. Care is there, healthcare is there, but it just looks a bit different. I think the other thing though now, and we're now in June 2020, is that we're all working with loss from a variety of different things, whether it's loss from a death, whether it's loss from being furloughed from your job, whether it's loss from being made redundant, whether it's loss from a loss of income. As we'll talk about in the, in the little bit on bereavement near the end, the impact on mental health on loss and on functioning and on resilience of teams actually is quite great, but it's kind of hidden because we don't tend to talk about it. But I think it's important for effective working of our communities and our healthcare systems. It's, it's important that we actually do recognise this. We're finding new ways to do things though, things have changed, but everything's different. So what's important I think for Signpost 2 is just think about that difference. Being flexible, being responsive to change is really helpful. We can't do things the way that we used to do. We'd love to have brought you all to Cardiff to do the summer school here in Cardiff. We love meeting people, chatting in person, at the lunch breaks, at the coffee breaks. We can't do that. It is not safe. So it's about just trying to be able to let go of some of those things which have worked before and in sense embrace things that are new, embrace the opportunity that things give you. You need to work from fact. You need to use social media sparingly. You need to, I think we need to think about what we're doing. So for example, communication methods, so consultations in healthcare, or if you're in business, your communications with business. It's great, isn't it? We can Zoom, we can use all sorts of virtual platforms. We don't physically need to be in the same space as somebody, mostly. So for me, working in the palliative care community in Cardiff, it's really important that myself and my colleagues in the palliative care team and that includes the wider team district nurses gps if somebody wants to be at home to die at home it's really important that somebody from the team visits them in that house really to understand how the house works how the dynamic works where's the support going to be are people upstairs do they need their bed to be downstairs if it's not at the end of life, if they're having difficulty mobilising around the house, unless you've physically been in that house and seen that person, it's very difficult. But not every visit needs to be in person. So I think being strategic in the use of the different consultation methods, different communication skills methods is really important. One of the amazing things I think has been the way that the pandemic has brought communities together 
whether it's been with the clapping, whether it's been social media groups. And one of our, our hopes, in a sense, is that that feeling of connectedness is that we don't lose that as in the UK lockdown lifts, because that community support, that community caring is what's going to make a difference for somebody who is facing the end of their life coming sooner than they would have expected. So I think the impact on team working in health and social care is around the actual composition of the team. Because if you think about it, particularly with coronavirus 19, it takes a high temperature or a persistent cough or a change in taste and smell for somebody to be off until they're tested. So when you're in your teams, you need to be building resilience to, okay, so if two people are off tomorrow, how are we going to get the work done? So that's an important thing for people to understand that actually that continuity of care, it's the care that's continuous, but it might not be the person who's delivering it. And that's just because that's what the virus is doing. But as a result of that, I think it's going to make teams more flexible and therefore more resilient. There are less face-to-face in-person contacts, as we've talked about. If you're interacting with somebody, you may well need to be wearing a version of um, PPE, depending on what you're doing, what the level of that interaction is. So we go out and um, when we visit people at home at the moment, uh, beginning of June 2020, with level one PPE, including a visor. That brings challenges to communication, which I shall come on to shortly. But the downside of this is that there's isolation. So we need to find ways of connecting people. Practical things, Pharmacies may have changed their hours. I think now in June, most arrangements, most businesses, most healthcare settings have started to have some level of functioning back again. But they may not have the same opening hours as they did. There may be slightly different arrangements. But one of the huge impacts for coronavirus on health and social care has been visiting policies. So to try to reduce the spread, to try to, we have to reduce footfall is what they say. So there's no visiting, less visiting, or even no visiting um, in certain areas of healthcare. Some of the issues around that are being relaxed slightly, partly in response to the importance for grieving of families to have some kind of connection with the person who has died if it's right at the end of life. But at the moment, it's very variable and we're encouraging people just to check but not to work on the premise that if your loved one has to go into hospital or is in a care home you're going to be able to visit because you may not be able to get there so what can we do what can we do we can expect the changes we can anticipate the changes and work with them the beauty of care is the care that's continuous it's not necessarily the people delivering it and that's just because they might have to be at home self-isolating or they may be sick themselves Things will happen, but they're going to happen more slowly. Things might need planning. It's no longer going to be possible just to nip down to GP surgery, into a &E, whatever. It, it, it will not happen in quite the same way. Older colleagues and relatives, particularly older relatives, may find that difficult. Right at the start of the pandemic, this was a real issue. So for people living on their own, older, who were shielding, families living at a distance, Actually, how were they going to get their shopping delivered? How were the basic functions of living, eating, getting up in the morning? If you didn't have your package of care by then, how was it going to be arranged? That was a real issue. Now in June, things are a little bit calmer, but it still might take longer to sort out. So we need to really keep people's expectations um, set at the right level. So things will happen. The care is there. It just looks. I think one of the biggest challenges that people have faced come through in the media a little bit as well is actually the sudden realisation that you do need to talk about things that you and your family. You will need to encourage your patients, the people in your care, to talk about difficult things. Because certainly if it's virus related, things can happen really quickly. So do you know what's important? Have you shared what's important to you? And this may seem a, a little bit of a morbid and depressing conversation, but actually it, it is empowering if you can get some of the key principles 
feeling as comfortable as they can. I'm not going to say right because every family is different, every person is different. I think one of the things just again to build into that conversation is that at the moment things might still be a little bit different. At the start of the pandemic in March, for example, funerals, whatever you died from, whatever you died from, funerals, nobody there, perhaps one or two people. Now arrangements have lifted slightly and many funeral directors will say that you can have up to 10 people and depending where you live and where you work, there are slightly different arrangements. But you have to be flexible and you have to, you have to try and almost have a plan A and a plan B. If what you really want to happen isn't possible because of the situation in which we find ourselves, what's the next best? So there are some things over which we have no control. And it's about working the best we can within those things that we can control. The signpost four is about managing those expectations. And it's about thinking about how you would start those conversations. And if you never had these sort of conversations before, it can feel like a completely daunting task. But you don't have to do it all in one go. That's the first thing. And you can just test the water a little bit. Have you ever thought about a time when you might be less well? Is one of the ways to start. Do you remember what happened to Mrs. Jones living next door? The ambulance came and she went off to hospital. Have you ever thought about what that might happen if that happened to you? If people have been in hospital, asking them about that experience will also sometimes be helpful. But I think the biggest thing for us to understand is that it's about the conversation. There's been a lot in the media, particularly this year, 2020, around bulk signing of, for example, do not resuscitate forms or giving the impression that people have to sign things and all of these decisions are set in stone. This is advanced care planning, future care planning, what we're talking about. And it's about the conversation. It's not about signing pieces of paper, although, as I'll come on to, actually having something written down is helpful, but it's the conversation that's important. But if you've had some of those conversations, actually setting realistic expectations for yourself is important. And um, take time afterwards just to process it and talk it through with somebody. And if you can, actually having a second conversation is also helpful. Do you remember what we talked about last week? Have you had any more thoughts on that? That can often open up things. Some people are worried that they don't want to upset those around you. And that's a very valid point. However, one of the things again that the coronavirus has shown us is that it, 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 it is merciless. It, doesn't, it, it does not necessarily choose who it's going to, who it's going to affect. And you can, be needing palliative care skills, obviously, for everything else that's still going on, whether it's frailty, whether it's cancer, whether it's end stage heart failure, whether it's dementia. So actually making a plan enables, at a, at a calm time, enables things to be followed through when it's a crisis. It's really difficult to make good decisions in a crisis because there is so much happening. One of the key things that we found really useful is a little thing in the UK called message in a bottle, which is a little canister. There's a picture here, which you put in the fridge and the emergency services will know that if there's a sticker on the front door, they go to the fridge and there's a canister. And in that little canister might be, if there was a do not resuscitate form, a copy of the form, or there might be who to ring if there are difficulties in health. So as a way of communicating issues, that can be really helpful. But I think one of the fundamental things about these difficult emotional conversations, trying to be in the space with that person and that conversation. Try and create that bubble around you and that other person so that the phone ringing, the dogs, your work, the children, other elderly relatives are, are not part of it. You have to be there and you have to be listening. That can be really difficult, particularly in the busy, very uncertain, stressful world that we've lived in. But for an effective conversation, it can sometimes cut down the need for conversations because you have been really listening and really sharing and processing what that person wants. 
think it's worth just a quick thought about what healthcare professionals may need to know. If they come and see you or your relative, there are things that they are going to need to know to help them establish how in this changed working environment we find ourselves, how best to get the appropriate support because things may take longer. But they may well need to know where the person who is ill would want to be. Would they want to stay in home? Would they go into a nursing home? Would they go into hospital if there was something that hospital could do? What are their thoughts on that? If you leave those conversations to the crisis situation, then decisions are made quickly without thought. For some people that might be preferable, but we know that the impact on grieving can be very great particularly that feeling of being out of control. So healthcare professionals will ask about where people might want to be. They will ask about whether you may have appointed a part lasting power of attorney around about health or around about finance. They may ask about wishes around cardiopulmonary resuscitation, just because it's really important to establish that to need to, to be able to direct future care. So, it's not that there's a checklist of this, this, this and this. These are really important things that in order to get the best quality of life at the end of life or the best quality of life in serious illness or the best quality of death, if it's the end of life, healthcare professionals need to know these things. That's why they're asking. And so I think that sometimes can be a way in to having these conversations. But just very quick. In Cardiff, colleagues develop what we started to call, what we learned to call over the last number of years, the Cardiff Six Point Toolkit. And it's been in existence since around about 2008. But my colleague Nikki Pease published, around, published about it in the Oxford Textbook of Communication in Oncology um, in 2017. And there are six tools that you can use for effective communication. And it works whatever the setting. So this is not a breaking bad news. Um, it can be used for breaking bad news as the style of consultation, but this is not a framework for breaking bad news. This is a framework for having effective palliative care conversations. So for example, if we think about comfort, that's comfort both for the person in front of you. Are they sitting comfortably? Are they in pain? Have they got lots of distractions around them? It's also your comfort. Actually, are you hungry? Are you tired? Have you eaten? Have you drunk enough? Are you desperate to visit the bathroom? If you're restless, your concentration is not going to be focused on that person. So think about comfort. Think about language. And language is both the verbal spoken language, but it's also body language. What we don't say can sometimes be more telling than what we do say. So how do people look? Do they look relaxed? Have they got eye contact with you? as well as what they do say, listen to those words. The words can be, can be really telling for what people are thinking. If somebody mentions their condition, for example, if somebody mentions the word cancer, then that might be that that's a word that you can use when you're talking with them. Question style. Sometimes you need to ask very focused questions. If somebody is in pain in front of you, is in distress, is in crying with pain, or very breathless, Asking them open questions that require long answers may not be appropriate for that particular situation. And you might need to ask a very closed question. Are you in pain? Where is the pain? However, for the sensitive communications, conversations around advanced care planning, future care planning, actually asking those open questions. I wonder what your thoughts are about. Open questions are questions where it's not a yes, no answer. That can open up. That conversation. So think about your question tile and think about the context in which you're using it. Listening is a really important skill and that's that ability of how do you show that you're listening? Do you make an occasional noise, a, mm, a nod of the head? Um, do you ask questions occasionally? One of the things you can do to show your listening is to, is to reflect back some of the things that people say. So somebody might say, I'm feeling really tired today. And you could just say, tired? And that shows that you've actually been listening to the words that they use and you want, you want to know a little bit more. 
So reflecting back is a useful tool and summarising is a really useful tool. So if you've had a lot of information given to you and, and people have suddenly opened up and their thoughts are coming loud and clear and fast and furious, sometimes it can be helpful just to say, let me just see if I've got this right. So what we've talked about is one, two, three, four, five. There can be other sessions around the card of six point toolkit, but as a toolkit for effective conversations, whatever the situation, it's a very useful toolkit to understand and to use. And it works in all situations for all ages. What about PPE though? What about if you're there, you're trying to have these conversations behind a surgical mask and with a visor that may or may not be steaming up? It still works. So for that conversation, have you warned the person that you're going to be in PPE so they know what to expect? Really important. You've got to maintain a distance. Now, people are much more aware of distancing. In the early days this year, they weren't. And we needed to explain why we were at a distance. And that's partly reinforcing the government messages. If the patient lip reads, then they're going to be stuck because the mask is there. So actually having somebody's deaf, having somebody with them to help with read is really important. And there may be some conversations that you start when you're face to face with somebody in somebody's home, but then actually the follow up conversation may need to be virtual using a screen. And that's how you get it the most effective. Choose your communication style for the context. Your, the language, your nonverbal language is in sharp focus because people can't see, they can't see your lips. They can see your eyes though, particularly if you're wearing level one PPE. They can see your eyes, they can see your forehead. They will know if you're relaxed, they will be able to see if you're smiling. You can tell by people's voice if they're smiling or if they're somber. So pay attention to, to your nonverbal and to how the words are coming out. Then the rest of the toolkit is no change except that you may need, if you're in a very coronavirus positive situation, if that's the situation, you may need to try to be a bit strategic in what you're asking because you need to limit the time that you're there. And summarising is probably more important than ever. It's really important to make plans that can be seen through. So, signpost five, patients and the understand that we may be out of our comfort zone too. Certainly in the early days of using different equipment, it can feel very disabling as a healthcare professional. But even though lockdown is lifting in some parts of the world, actually what this virus has shown is that it can, situations can change overnight and the unimaginable <clears throat> can happen. So talking about people about what they might want if they were less well or when they are less well. <clears throat> Do it now at a point that actually you can have those conversations will help later on. I think it's worth just talking about though if things are not going well. So if somebody has been ill, is ill, and you feel that they may be running out of options to actually improve the situation or cure the situation feel very difficult with the coronavirus it has felt very lonely things are beginning to shift but it feels a very lonely place and the biggest thing has been managing uncertainty so what can you do what can you do when things are not going well how connected can you be if you've had those conversations that's great if you haven't can you start them have you got somebody in the family who can be there with the person or who is nearest but actually for you as well, it's about setting your networks for afterwards. So we're often preparing families to think, OK, so if things are going to get difficult over the next few weeks, who's there to support you? Setting realistic expectations, as we've said, health and social care is there. It just looks a bit different. And people will really pull out all the stops and do the best for, for that person, for you, for your family but it may just take a little bit longer and it may just look a bit different. But how connected can you be is the key question. Managing hope and uncertainty is difficult, isn't it? It's a bit like driving in freezing fog where there's fog and then your windscreen fogs up as well. 
I think one of the things that we can do is to work out actually what are the facts that we are certain about. Navigating through the fog of uncertainty, there will be some things that you can be certain about, like when is the next call? When am I going to call my mum, my partner, my family next? If you're that person, though, you need to deliver. Because if you say you're going to ring the next day and you don't, you've added to that person's uncertainty. So it's about thinking of each person as an individual and what are the things that you can be certain about. I could be certain about the fact that there will be somebody coming in to prepare breakfast or to deliver the medicines or to come and see how you are. So what can you be certain about? Finding those hooks to hang the facts on. That can be a really useful thing. The coronavirus has made uncertainty the new norm and it feels really difficult. But within that, there are some things that are certain. So what can you be certain about? And signpost seven, as the end of life appears to be near, if you're in that situation, communication is key. Because everybody who needs to, is everybody aware? People living away at the moment in 2020 may not be able to come, but they might need to know what's happening to prepare them for the fact that this person is nearing the end of their lives. If you're a health and social care professional, we need to think practically. Have we got symptom control for pain, for breathlessness, for distress, and what's relevant to the patient? Not everybody needs pain control. If they haven't needed pain control during their last illness, they're not necessarily going to be in pain for the last few days. What's relevant to the patient and are supplies there? Have you got supplies of medication in that house ready for the situation? You want to, you want to smooth, you want a smooth transition in those last few, in those last few days of life. You don't want to be suddenly having to find medicine that actually could have been got a few days before. And stopping unnecessary medicines. It's real burden to swallow medicines if you're tired. Preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best. Just thinking a little bit beyond that. This last next few minutes is just about a few words about grief and grieving. I think many of us have been affected, some for the first time in the pandemic. And what's been different this year, and there are a number of, of podcasts and conversations about this, because I think it's really important for people to understand, is that people may not have been able to be there. So instead of the classic everybody around the bed, holding hands, crying, talking, being silent, being still, people may physically just have not been able to be there. Usual arrangements are different. The usual funerals are not there. So what that done, it's made a usually emotional time feel very very strange, very weird, very disconnected. So again, what can you do? You can expect it to be different and warn people that it's going to be. Everybody's been experiencing the same difficulties so far, but what we are finding now in the bereavement services in City Hospice, as we ring people and as we talk with them, is that actually as lockdown is beginning to ease and people are beginning to meet with others more, actually grief is revisited so grief this year is of a slightly different type and complexity than ever before if you've been able to have those conversations before it can make the grieving process more straightforward i'm not going to say easier because grief is grief you're adjusting to a loss but it can be a little bit more straightforward with less questioning and there will be a time in the future where gatherings can happen but understanding that people grieve in different ways at different times within the same family sometimes is useful. We have to set realistic expectations. The organisation Cruz has got some really helpful in information on their website, <laughs> particularly around people who have experienced bereavement this year during the coronavirus crisis. Just a very quick word about models of grief. Many people are familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the stages. But the trouble is that it sometimes implies that it's a linear process, that you do one stage and then you go on to the next and then you go on to the next. And grief in real life isn't like that at all. It's a big muddle of emotions and you're fine in the morning and you're on the floor in the afternoon. You're fine at breakfast time and by coffee time, it's a bad day. That's, that's grief. 
Grief is accepting the loss. Look at William Warden's tasks. There are four things that happen in random orders at random times, but moving through that grief, the loss has happened. We're acknowledging the pain, we're adjusting to a new environment, and we're reinvesting in a new life. And then the most recent version of that is the Strobership dual process model, where you pass your days sometimes thinking more about the loss and feeling sad, and then sometimes thinking about moving forward and actually how can I live in the world where that person isn't? And both of those are okay. But it can sometimes feel a little bit wrong to be feeling a little bit more at peace and even smile and have a joke in the immediate aftermath of somebody dying. That's just part of what the brain is doing, part of the brain's process. So there are different models, but grief is really, I think William Warden is the most useful collection of ways of thinking about grief. It is a response to a loss and it can be a loss to anything. It can be a loss to person, it can be loss of a job, it can be loss of a role, it can be loss of functioning. So I'm post for grieving, it's universal. It's a mental adjustment. It can be different for everybody. It's got no set time frame. I think what time does is that it allows you time to practice how you're going to respond to the situation. People say, oh, time will heal anything. I'm not sure that's right, actually, but time gives you practice at living in the world where the person isn't and possibly developing a, a new interest and, and a new life. Working with people before they die can be helpful because it can help set the signposts for your own grieving. But if you're grieving and if you're finding it difficult, particularly this year, never be afraid to ask for help. So winding up now for the last few minutes. I'm back to the beginning. Palliative care is everyone's business. We're going to see palliative care in our work, wherever you work, whether it's in health and social care, whether it's in any other discipline, environment, self-employed, palliative care is everyone's business for ourselves, for our families, for our communities. Useful for everybody to have that understanding of that maintaining quality of life right up until, right up until the end, but actually working with a different environment which the coronavirus pandemic has brought us this year. This is kind of resetting, resetting the systems moving forward. And so finally, what about you? Doing all of this stuff, delivering all of this stuff, what about you? The important thing is everybody's got to have a place in the pandemic. Everybody's got a place in the new normal, everybody's business. You need to be kind, set yourself realistic expectations, but be mindful of language. We have found that actually trying to concentrate on the things that you can do rather than the huge number of things that we can't do has actually kept us all grounded because there are things you can do you are in control of you but try to have some time in each day to switch the brain off try to live to eat to drink healthily take things a day at a time it's too uncertain so go back to uncertainty what can i be certain about i can probably be certain about what i'm doing today not so sure about tomorrow but today's fine keep in communication with people use all the results and support available and and time never goes backwards. So we're never going to get back to how we were in February in the UK or in November, December if you were out in the Far East. Time doesn't go backwards. Time moves forward. So what can we learn about how we've gone through this last six months to help us move forward to whatever the new normal is? Everybody's business. Together we can do this. Here are some useful resources, particularly focused around Wales. If you're interested in palliative care, if you need palliative care advice, wherever you're working, everywhere will have their local palliative care team. And there are some really useful websites, but particularly around some of the mental health issues around managing loss, the coronavirus pandemic, then the cruise website is particularly, particularly useful. And the Baker's Dozen toolkit is done by colleagues in Cardiff and it's a very useful personal resilience survival, survival tool. So I'd like to finish just by saying thank you so much for joining us and um, we've got some time for questions and answers now. Palliative care is everyone's business. As we say we used to run one day and two day short courses. 
we will be running CPD events moving forward around palliative care. They'll just look a bit different, but we'll be updating via our Twitter feed. And if anybody's interested in studying further with us for the master's course of which I'm the programme director, then I'd be delighted to hear from you. Oh, thank you very much, Fiona. We've got um, one question before we finish. Um, what do you think are the main barriers that prevent someone from passing away at home peacefully and pain-free, if that is their wish? Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Am I all right? So I still keep my slide on my, the slide on the. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. I think I think one of I think the barriers are often around being able to communicate what people's wishes are to their healthcare delivery team. Um, for us, supporting somebody in that way, it's going to be around just that meticulous assessment, understanding that people get pain for different reasons and different analgesics, different strategies work for different pains. So if you're a healthcare professional and you're looking after somebody whose pain is not well controlled, then have you thought about asking your local palliative care team for some advice? allowing for the fact that we may not be able to get there in an hour's time, it might take us a little bit different, might make a little bit differently. But quite a lot of the barriers can also be communication, and that's communication between patient and family, between patient family and the healthcare professionals, and between healthcare professionals helping to deliver that care. It's absolutely vital that we are joined up. It takes time, there aren't any shortcuts. Shortcuts never work. It takes time, it takes planning, um, and it takes, it takes knowing who you can ask, I think, knowing who you can ask for advice. In terms of availability of things like analgesics and painkillers across the world, there is still great variety. The Lancet Commission on Pain and Suffering is about to um, re review its report from 2017, and there are still inequalities which we need to work hard to address. Um, but in places where painkillers and a wide variety of painkillers are available, there are now many people who know how to use them safely and how to prescribe them safely. So we should also then be able to talk with patients and families and allay people's fears because people are still frightened of painkillers and frightened of the side effects. However, thinking quality of life, managing people's pain and trying to, trying to enable people to be pain-free is really important. The one last thing I would say though is that pain is multi-dimensional. Dame Cicely Saunders coined the phrase of total pain, where for anybody's pain who needs palliative care, there will be a physical element to it, whatever their condition is that's providing, that, that, that's causing them to be near the end of life. There will be a psychological element to it because the pain will mean something to that person. So I'm not saying psychological means all in the brain, absolutely not. I'm saying that for somebody, the meaning of that pain will be impacting on how they perceive the pain. There's a social element to pain. What is the pain not enabling me to do? And there's a spiritual element to the pain. Actually, is the pain something around me and my being and what this means for me and actually living on the world? So pain is not just about painkillers. And I'm saying that because sometimes we strive and strive to get on top of somebody's pain as the end of life is near. But some of the deep family issues, the deep um, dynamics that might have gone on sometimes, unless they're put right as you go along, and that's what I mean when I say actually palliative care is about how to live, sometimes the end of life comes before you have had a chance to right the wrong, to say I'm sorry, to say I love you, to visit people, to talk with people who you've not talked about. So pain is a multi-dimensional thing. Painkillers are part of the management, but there are other elements to it too. Oh, thank you very much, Fiona. I think that's probably all the time we've got for this morning. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending um, today, and I'd like to thank Fiona very much for a wonderful session. You've had some lovely comments already about how helpful people have found it. Um, you've got the Cardiff University CPD Twitter and Fiona's Twitter up there for other courses that we may be running that you may be interested in. And Fiona's done some great podcasts, which we'll make sure that we circulate to you all after this session. It can be another helpful resource. Um, if you want to get in touch, you've got our Twitter page there, our 
um, email address. Um, have a good day, everyone. Take care.